In this video, we'll be discussing part one of evolution. Now, evolution is the change of species over time. Now, there are different kinds of evolution. Major, the, the two major types of evolution are microevolution and macroevolution. So they're very different. Microevolution are very, very small changes that happen in a short period of time. They're very small to see, but the small changes add up over large periods of time. So I'm talking like small periods, I'm talking like maybe hundreds of years, you know, multiple hundreds of years, even thousands of years. That would be considered microevolution. Macroevolution is over like billions of years, right? Um, Earth has been around for about 3.5 billion years. So from that point in time, we are looking at large scale evolution, which again, we call macro, macro means large. And all of those small changes that occur through time will add up to these very large changes that are very easy to see. Um, we have species that die off, and other species that evolve from that. So when you look at macroevolution, you're gonna look at these huge changes of, oh my gosh, this species doesn't even exist anymore. I can't believe something like that even existed. Um, and you know, in terms of microevolution, you could see you know, little small changes. Maybe the behavior of a certain species is changing or their location of where they're living or maybe you know, the color of their coat. Um, little small changes that, again, very tough to see over small periods of time. So an example of macroevolution would be the changes between the woolly mammoth and our present day elephant. Now as you can see, um, they have very similar body structures. Um, their legs are about the same you know, size. Obviously the mammoth is a little bit taller. But if you take a look at the physical characteristics, the tusks are much larger on the mammoth as the elephants are. Um, we have the nose being much larger. They have a lot more hair, a lot longer hair. Their head and their back is shaped differently in comparison to the modern day elephant. And again, these adaptations or these characteristics are direct adaptations of the environment. The woolly mammoth used to live in a very cold environment, hence why they have much more fur. Today's elephants live in very warm environments, so if anything, the fur would harm them because it would get them their bodies to overheat. Um, maybe another reason why the tusks are so long was maybe they had to dig through the ice in order to find food. They needed a longer tusk in order to do that where the modern day elephants don't have to do that, so the tusks have shrank in size over time. Again, it's very important to remember that when discussing evolution, these changes do not occur overnight. That's why I have up here, gradually changing over time. And I don't mean time again, I have to stress, it's not 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, 100 years, hundreds of years, it is thousands and thousands of years, or millions and millions of years, billions of years. It is a large scale, gradual changes that you can only really see these major changes over long periods of time. Jean-Baptiste de Lamarck, he was the first person, first scientist, to actually discover that organisms and species change over time. Now unfortunately, his ideas at the time, even though correct in terms of there was change occurring over time, um, his scientific reasoning ended up being disproven. Um, what he used to figure this out was just assumptions and you know what he was able to see around him. So at the time, he came up with three assumptions on as an explanation as to why organisms and species would change over time. The first thing he hypothesized was that all organisms have some type of urge inside of them that want to change and they want to better themselves. 
And because of that, they're able to physically change themselves. And not only can they do that, but they can also pass down these changed genes, which again, that's not true. But at the time before technology was available and before anyone, you know, had the ability to really research this um, from the naked eye that, you know, that could possibly be true. But if something's changing, you know, who's going to change it except you, right? The second hypothesis that he came up with was use and disuse. So if you did not want to use a particular part of your body and you wanted to overuse another part, you could alter the shape of your body by just saying, hey, I don't want to really use this anymore. So maybe an example would be um, if a giraffe, you know, wanted a longer neck, he would just stretch his neck and continue to stretch it. And that was actually the animal that Lamarck used as an example. He believed, he truly believed that giraffes had large necks because they just continually stretch them throughout their life, which again, we all know that's not true. But back then that, you know, he saw changes of, oh, hey, you know, some of them have short necks and some of them have long necks. It must just be that the ones that have long necks overuse their necks, which again, not true. Uh, and the third hypothesis that he came up with was the passing on of acquired traits. There are people today that still think that this is true and it is, it is not true. Um, if let's just say you are very into, you know, bodybuilding and, you know, you spend your whole life eating right and working out and, you know, making sure that your muscles are really big, um, that does not increase your chances whatsoever of passing on any type of muscular build to your offspring. Um, just because you look that way doesn't mean that you have the genes to be there because if you weren't putting in the effort and the time and eating right and working out and having a special diet, you probably wouldn't look that way. So using that as an example, um, the only traits that can be passed on are hereditary traits that are embedded in your DNA, not something that is what we call acquired. And acquired means that you take it upon yourself to change something about yourself. Those traits cannot be passed on to the next generation. As stated before, those three hypotheses that Lamarck um, did come up with were just proven over time with increased technology and increased, um, you know, looking into and studying and observing species, but he is still credited with being one of the first people to recognize that evolution did occur and does occur. Now let's talk about Charles Darwin, who is considered to be the father of evolution. He is the scientist who truly discovered how traits are passed down. Um, and today his theories are still unable to be disproven. Um, so the what, where he actually studied was in the Galapagos Islands and what made him come up with the idea of evolution and how these traits are passed down was he noticed that plants and animals on the coast of the island were very similar to, ver to mirroring islands where it almost looked like that those islands at one point were puzzle pieces prior to the movement of Pangaea. And if anyone doesn't know what Pangaea is, that was um, a point in time when all of the continents were one large puzzle piece. And then through continental drift and you know the movement of the continental plates, uh, now we have our continents that are all spread out. But if you were to fit them together, um, they would fit perfectly like a puzzle piece. So what he started noticing, especially in the Galapagos Islands, was that on the edges of these so-called puzzle pieces, where they were to match, they have very similar animals and very similar plants. But those plants and animals are not exactly the same. So what he hypothesized was that at one point when it was Pangaea, 
that all of these plants and animals live together in one area. They were exactly the same. And because they now live in different areas, right? So at one point they were the same, then Pangea split. And then because they're in different areas and those animals had to adapt to their new environments, they acquired new characteristics and they acquired new traits and they had to adapt because of that, that caused different changes in those different species. So maybe one species had to adapt to a colder environment, maybe they grew more hair, or maybe the plants were a little bit thicker so they could, you know, deal with the, the harsher winters, where in the warmer areas, maybe the hair either became non-existent or very thin in certain animals, or maybe they, you know, had adapted ways to, you know, deal with the cold, I'm sorry, to deal with the hot, or um, maybe the plants themselves are a lot thinner, so they don't, you know, they're able to transpire and, and have the, um, the water and transpiration move through the plant a lot faster in the hotter weathers. So, again, the way, the way that he came up with the theory of evolution is he simply just observed areas around where Pangea had split and noticed that the plants and the animals at one point were probably the same because they look similar, but they do have certain adaptations that fit their environment best. So Darwin's overall theory of how traits are passed down from generation to generation through a particular species causing all of these adaptational changes is called natural selection. And really all that means, it's a process in which the genes and the adaptations that are favorable, only the favorable ones, are going to be the organisms that survive because they have these favorable traits. And therefore, they're going to live to the reproductive age. And because of that, they are the ones who are going to be able to pass down their genes. So natural selection equals pretty much means survival of the fittest. So let's just use the example of the peppered moth. Um, back in the industrial days when there was a lot of soot around, you know, soot is almost like this black ashy kind of stuff. Um, there was a lot of black soot in a particular area, you know, a bunch of like warehousey um, areas that have a lot of, you know, factory towns. And the moths, there are you know, these things called peppered moths, and only the moths that already had black specks. So some of them would have more black specks than others, just naturally. Some would look more white, some would look more gray, some would look white with the black spots. And the ones that had, that were white with the black spots, they blended in with the environment a lot better because everything in that surrounding area had this black soot around it. And what it did was is actually used as camouflage or acted as camouflage favorably, not on purpose, just happened to be they were just in that particular area where this was helpful. So the moths that were gray and the moths that were white, they were able to be seen by predators a lot easier. Therefore, they were, they became prey a lot faster and they were not able to reproduce. They weren't around long enough to pass on their, you know, gray moth genes or their white moth genes. But the peppered moths, the ones that were specked, right, they had the speckles on them, they were able to hide from their predators. They did not come, become prey as, as much as the other colors were. Therefore, they were able to live long enough to you know, be at their reproductive age and they were able to pass on their speckled genes, which then, of course, increases the majority of that next generation to have speckled genes to the point where now the peppered moth only has speckled colors. They're white with, with these black specks all over them. Even after the Industrial Revolution was over, it's still now to this day is something that is passed on because of that environmental adaptation. Now let's also take a look at the giraffes. Um, as we said earlier, 
uh, Lamarck thought through observation that if giraffes, you know, stretched their necks long enough, uh, they'd be able to just grow longer necks. And again, we all know that that's not true. Um, but what really happens is that having a long neck is favorable. It's a favorable trait to have for a giraffe because a lot of animals want to graze along the ground. But how many animals can really reach at the top of a tree and get all their food? So the giraffes with the longer neck are able to get more food and be more nourished and they're able to live long enough to reach the reproductive age. The ones with shorter necks, like over here, they can't reach all that food up there. So they're forced to go with the same food down here that the cows are grazing, that you know the lions are grazing, or whatever organism around is grazing, right? They are not, they need to share that food and the giraffes with the longer necks, they have as much food as they want. So the ones that with the shorter necks, they typically would die off because they didn't have enough nourishment to reach the reproductive age. They didn't have enough food. They didn't have enough resources. But the long neck giraffes live long enough. They are the ones that can now reproduce. And now, mostly all giraffes have long necks because of that. I'm sure there are still, you know, some short neck uh, giraffes around, but they are nowhere, you know, uh, they're they're a minority in comparison to the, the long neck giraffes. So just to restate, the natural selection, Darwin's theory predicts that over time, the number of individuals that carry advantage traits will increase in population. So again, as said before, when you are, when you have a trait that's favorable and it allows you to get more resources, it's really what it's all about is being able to um, hide from your predators and to get resources. And if those traits are able to get you that advantage to do those two things, well then you have a higher chance of reaching reproductive age and passing on those genes. Again, that's where the term survival of the fittest comes from. Fittest meaning, do you have more advantaged traits more so than the next individual?